there. Welcome to m and Advisor. And my name's Alex Rosens. I'm with Bloomberg LP in New York. I'm a editor for the Bloomberg Briefs Bankruptcy and Restructuring Newsletter, which is about two and a half years old. And we're here with Steve Karakin, uh, partner, uh, senior partner over at uh, Wild Gottschall in New York. And uh, most recently, his uh, big assignment was uh, to be on debtor counsel for AMR. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, wanted to find out what your thoughts were uh, on how AMR developed. It started out as a case uh, in Chapter 11 where it wanted to emerge as its own entity, and yet it emerged as a merged uh, business. Yeah, let, me, let me address that. I, I think that uh, when we filed the AMR case in, in, no, in November of 2011, it was uh, unlike what has been typically going on in the market, a rather traditional Chapter 11 filing um, where we needed to use the tools of Chapter 11 to, uh, let's say, right-size the operation, fix the left side of the balance sheet, as well as later on then ad address the capital structure. Uh, I think going into Chapter 11, the original thought was uh, AMR would emerge as a standalone company. Uh, but as things developed, and, and again, taking into account that the board was very cognizant of its fiduciary duties to maximize value. Uh, and what management did was to put the company in a position through uh, the operational restructuring, addressing pension issues, addressing the fleet, addressing labor, uh, addressing gate leases and, and other facilities, was to put it in a position where um, it could evaluate strategic alternatives in the context of uh, a standalone plan. Um, and, and, and really evaluate those, those alternatives from a position of strength uh, because it had put the company in, a, in the position to maximize revenue, to maximize value, and to maximize its competitive position. So when other alternatives came around, and we did have a collaborator, collaborative process with the Unsecured Creditors Committee to evaluate alternatives, and of course U.S. Airways had been out there for a while expressing its interest, uh, and, and what the board did was to analyze with its advisors uh, what type of value proposition each of those scenarios would result in for all of its stakeholders. And when I say all of its stakeholders, I mean creditors, mm -hmm. uh, customers, and importantly, existing equity. Uh, and the board was very cognizant of its fiduciary duties to all of those stakeholders to maximize value. And when the U.S. Airways uh, proposal came forward and that proposal was negotiated um, with all of the elements, including the equity split among both uh, the American creditors and shareholders as well as the U.S. Airways shareholders, uh, the value proposition for American stakeholders was just overwhelming where it wasn't even uh, uh, a big decision for the board um, to, to go that direction, and, um, and you can see what happened. Uh, uh, I think that we, we have a situation in America where um, the value that's been realized for stakeholders is unprecedented, and I think that if you look at uh, airline Chapter 11 cases, the, the, the legacy carriers in the past, if you look at Delta, United, Continental, uh, in none of those cases have creditors been paid in full, and certainly in none of those cases has equity received a distribution, much less the distribution um, that existing AMR shareholders have received. Um, which in, which in was pretty remarkable because we started off at 40 cents on the day of Chapter 11 filing, roughly, and we ended up at roughly today north of $30. And there's a similar pattern with the bonds uh, from AMR where the paper was in 30 to 40 cents range and then it went over par and it was squarely over par. It dipped a little when the DOJ announced its uh, issues with the uh, merger, but here we are, very much north of $1.40, $1.50. Right, and, and again, the plan uh, provided the bondholders with not only principal, but principal plus pre-petition interest, principal plus post-petition interest, and interest on interest. And, and also there was some element in there uh, over the course of time when the value was being distributed to the stakeholders to protect them um, against the risk, the volatility risk over the 120 day period during which the value was distributed to the various stakeholders. So from the perspective of, of the unions, the customers, the creditors, the shareholders, uh, I think that 
this case by any measurement was extraordinarily successful um, and the returns unprecedented and I'm you know I'm hesitant to say this will never happen again right but uh, to see returns like this in a chapter 11 case um, I think it's going to be a long time I think the last case we saw existing equity getting a significant return was in general growth GGP GGP yeah okay uh, and, and what's your take on, it was interesting, U.S. Air uh, was eyeing this asset, this company, and, um, but they had to be a little bit shy because they had been rebuffed before when they approached a bankruptcy courthouse to, to buy a carrier out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, U.S. Airways and Mr. Parker had, had learned from what had happened uh, in the past, for example, in the Delta case, mm -hmm. when they were overly aggressive in, in trying to come into the case. I think that in, in this situation they were able and, and strategically able to take advantage of uh, relationships with labor uh, and to go out to labor and to, tr and to strike deals with labor. Uh, I think they were able to take advantage of the fact that American's history with its labor unions has not been the best. Uh, there's been a lot of animosity. Uh, I will say I'm not sure I really understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but b I think because of that animosity created an opening for for uh, Mr. Parker and, and U.S. Airways to come in and strike a deal with labor uh, maybe a year into the case, which sort of helped to formulate you know, the backdrop for a, for a deal. But again, uh, the overwhelming value that was created by the merger um, uh, from the perspective of the board, um, that was the only economic deal that, that made sense and certainly maximized value for all parties in interest. So in a world of airlines, do you think it's all clear skies for them from now on? Or is there something in the horizon that concerns you? For example, we have some political risk world globally that might chase up oil prices mm -hmm. for them. Or we have the bad weather conditions mm -hmm. of the last three to four months. Right. I think that, look, uh, the airlines have always been cyclical. Uh, they're subject to... Um, the market, certainly the fuel market, uh, no one can predict the fuel market. They try to hedge. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. I think that they have managed um, quite well to address their cost structure. Uh, and I think that's obviously reflected in the stock prices to date. Uh, I think they've, they've addressed their load factors. Uh, and I think they, they are now, you know, poised to take advantage of the situation. But again, you have a cyclical business. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be the next round of negotiations with their unions and let's see what happens then. Right. Uh, Away from airlines, what's your take on the bankruptcy uh, the, the just activity? It, it seems like we've really come down quite a bit. We follow Chapter 11's at Bloomberg Brief uh, for all cases a million and more business-wise and they were down in uh, 2013 from 2012 and they've been trending lower. We haven't seen a lot of billion dollar cases until the last say seven to ten days. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, those were prepacks. Uh, that's an interesting point. Well, I think the three that cases that were filed last week were all prepacks. Those deals have been around, as I understand it, for a couple of years being negotiated. Uh, default rates are way down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we saw a huge drop off in default rates in 2013 and certainly now in 2014. Uh, there is a lot of money out there um, that can fix deals, uh, people can refinance, there are covenant light deals that can be refinanced. I think that um, uh, during the low interest rate period of, of 2012 and 13, um, the companies that may have been in distress or worried about distress were able to refinance right. and push out their maturities, uh, you know, amend and extend. Uh, so I think that the market, uh, I think the market will be slow for the next 12 to 18 months. And I think that, let me just interject sure. another, in terms of traditional chapter 11s, such as an AR, AMR chapter 11 or, or some of the things that we used to see in the 90s or early 2000s, uh, I think with all the leverage in the system uh, and, and uh, the amount of secured debt that, that um, companies have, traditional long-term chapter 11s will not happen uh, on a regular basis at all. And, and, and I think we've seen the trend over the last 10 years. You have the secured creditors basically, because they control the financing, and there is no ability to obtain financing other than from those parties, uh, and with all the restrictions that they do put in when they do provide financing, most of the cases are either quick sales or prepacks. And I think that that trend 
will continue as we've certainly seen in the last um, few months. Well, Steve, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. And thank you. We're here from Palm Beach, Florida. It's uh, March of 2014. And my name is Alex Rosens. I'm from Bloomberg Briefs. Thank you very much. Thank you.